Imagine embarking on a journey that would take you across the entire known world, spanning over 30 years and covering a distance of more than 75,000 miles. Imagine traveling from Morocco to Mecca, China to Constantinople, and everywhere in between, all without the luxury of modern-day transportation. Now imagine doing all of that in the 14th century, when travel was slow, dangerous, and filled with countless other unknowns. Well, that's exactly what our hero did. Ibn Battuta, a 14th century explorer, was a man on a mission to see the world. From dodging bandits to escaping deadly plagues, Ibn Battuta had it all. His travels were nothing short of incredible, and today we'll be taking a deep dive into his life, his adventures, and his legacy. So sit back, relax, and get ready to be transported through time and across the globe, all thanks to one man's insatiable thirst for adventure. Before we begin, I just wanted to apologize in advance for mispronouncing anything. I unfortunately do not speak Arabic and will probably butcher a lot of names in the process. Our story begins in Tangier, a northwestern city in Morocco, where a young Ibn Battuta is set to begin his travels to Mecca to undertake pilgrimage and complete his religious duties. Well, that was the original plan at least. As Ibn Battuta prepares to leave Tangiers, he makes his way through the bustling city one final time. He couldn't help but be struck by the vibrant colors and exotic aromas surrounding him. The markets are particularly lively, with merchants haggling over everything from spices to textiles. The Kasbah, a type of fortress, loomed in the distance, a stark reminder of the city's strategic importance and the ongoing conflicts that plagued the region. As Ibn Battuta looked around, he couldn't help but notice the harbors, which were just as bustling and busy as the markets. As ships of all shapes and sizes jostled for position in the crowded waters, sailors shouted orders and heaved heavy bales of cargo onto the docks. The air was thick with the sounds of creaking timbers, clanging chains, and the thump of heavy ropes as they were coiled and uncoiled with practiced ease. The smell of salt water mingled with the heady aroma of spices and exotic fruits. Amidst the chaos, there were moments of surprising grace and beauty. The sleek lines of a merchant ship gliding into port, its sails billowing in the wind like a giant white bird. The delicate flutter of a seagull's wings as it swooped down to snatch a fish from the water. The sun glinting off the surface of the waves, painting the sea in shades of gold and blue. Despite the apparent disorder, there was a rhythm to the activity on the harbour, a kind of dance that only those who had spent their lives at sea could truly appreciate it. For Ibn Battuta, who had grown up in Tangiers and knew the harbour like the back of his hand, the sight of the ships coming and going was a comforting reminder of the world he knew so well. As he watched the ships disappear over the horizon, bound for distant lands he could only dream of, he felt a pang of longing mingled with the excitement of the adventure that lay ahead. Yet a feeling of apprehension lingered in Ibn Battuta's heart. After all, he was leaving his birthplace, his family and his friends behind. Ultimately, he was leaving the place he called home behind. As he heard the call to prayer from the nearby mosques, he knew that he was embarking on a journey of faith that would take him far beyond the borders of his beloved Tangiers. It was time for him to, quote, make the pilgrimage to the holy house at Mecca and of visiting the tomb of the prophet in Medina, God's richest blessing and peace be on him. End quote. Ibn Battuta pauses for one last moment to take in the sight of the ships in the harbor, their sails billowing in the breeze as they set off for far-flung destinations, and he realizes that it too is time for him to leave as he writes, quote, So I braced my resolution to quit all my dear ones, female and male, and forsook my home as birds, forsake their nests, end quote, and so began the travels of Ibn Battuta. As Ibn Battuta begins his travels through the mountainous interior of Morocco, he likely encounters some of the most challenging terrains of his journey. The narrow paths were treacherous and steep, and the rocky cliffs on either side seemed to threaten him with danger at every turn. Despite the difficulties, Ibn Battuta remained determined to reach his destination. He knew that the journey through the mountains was a necessary part of his travels, and he was eager to see what lay ahead. It has been weeks since Ibn Battuta begun his journey, and things were going fairly smoothly for the young Battuta. His destination, Tlemcen, 
a city east of Tangiers, which was ruled by the Zayayid dynasty, was within arms reach. Being the capital of the Zayanid, Tlemcen was a natural stop for a traveler going from Morocco to Tunisia, and although he was traveling alone, he had managed to avoid bandits who often attacked unprotected travelers. Fortunately for Ibn Battuta, 1325 was a relatively peaceful year, during which to make the crossing from Marinid to Zayanid territory. So, crossing the border between the two kingdoms was as easy as it could get for Ibn Battuta. Not to mention, as a religious traveler on pilgrimage, Ibn Battuta enjoyed a protection of sorts provided by local rulers. In addition, bandits were religious enough to hesitate to attack a traveler on pilgrimage. Although Tlemcen was an ideal stop, Ibn Battuta did not stay there for long, and so the city that was a crucial point in the Trans-Saharan trade route, mostly in gold and slaves, was merely a blip in the travels of Battuta. The lack of major cities between Morocco and the western parts of the Hafsid kingdom made Ibn Battuta's short stay seem like an even stranger choice. But Ibn Battuta explains his haste, quote, I came to the city of Tlemcen, the sultan of which at that time was Abu Tashufa, and my arrival chanced to coincide with the visit of two envoys of the king of Africa. These envoys left the town, and one of the brethren advised me to travel in their company. I consulted the will of Almighty God in regard to this, and after a stay of three nights in Tlemcen to procure what I needed, I left, riding after them with all speed, and on reaching the town of Melenia overtook them. Their end quote, it is believed that Ibn Battuta could have travelled through the green-brown valleys for several days at a time, without encountering any towns, only Berber camps and groups of camel herders. Finally, he caught up with a caravan of other travellers, including pilgrims like himself. Some of them walked, others rode horses, mules, donkeys or camels. As the group travelled through North Africa, they shared a common enthusiasm to complete the Hajj. They soon reached Algiers, a minor town at that time. The group camped outside the city walls, waiting for other pilgrims to join the caravan. Then they continued on through forests of oak and cedar, mountains and valleys, before reaching the city of Bijaya. And as things seemed to be going smoothly, disaster struck. Ibn Battuta fell ill. Ibn Battuta was so ill that his companion Abu Abdullah al-Zula al-Zubaidi suggested that he remain in Bijaya to recover. But Ibn Battuta was eager to reach Mecca and declined Abdullah's offer, saying, quote, If God decrees my death, then my death shall be on the road, with my face set towards Mecca. End quote. And so Ibn Battuta and his companions continue their journey. Abdullah did manage to convince Ibn Battuta to sell most of his baggage in Bijaya and travel light so that the group could move faster as the region was in a time of instability as the Hafsid and Zayanids were at war. The Hafsid dynasty was in a period of sustained weakness and was struggling to control its territory against both internal rebellions and pastoral tribes, particularly the Arab Banu Hilal, who came and went and marauded in Ifriqiya. The next stop was Constantine, where Ibn Battuta was warmly welcomed by the governor. At this point, Ibn Battuta and his companions have been on the road for a considerable amount of time. Just the previous night, they had spent getting rained on. Upon seeing the ragged shape that the travellers were in, the governor ordered their clothes be cleaned. He gifted Ibn Battuta money and a fine woolen cloak to replace his old shredded clothes. This would be the first of many gifts Ibn Battuta received on his travels. It became a motif in Battuta's story that pious Muslims would perform their religious duties of charity to the needy by helping out Ibn Battuta and other travellers. These gifts were sometimes considerable and would make Ibn Battuta a fairly wealthy individual at times, even though he would eventually lose everything. Despite the warm welcome Ibn Battuta received, he knew he had to leave the city and press on to complete his journey. Ibn Battuta fell ill once more, so ill that he had to be tied to a saddle to keep him from falling down. In the year 1325, Battuta arrived in Tunis for the first time having travelled through North Africa from his native Tangier. As he entered the city, he was struck by its grandeur and the bustling activity of its markets and streets. Tunis was a centre of trade and commerce, connecting the Mediterranean world to the African continent, and it had long been renowned for its wealth and prosperity. Ibn Battuta noted that it was the end of Ramadan, 
a time of celebration and feasting for Muslims around the world. Despite the festivities that surrounded him, Ibn Battuta felt a sense of loneliness in this foreign land. He had travelled a great distance from his home in Tangier, and the unfamiliarity of his surroundings left him feeling disconnected from those around him. He recalls, quote, I felt so sad at heart on account of my loneliness that I could not restrain the tears that started to my eye and wept bitterly. But one of the pilgrims, realising the cause of my distress, came up to me with a greeting and friendly welcome and continued to comfort me with friendly talk until I entered the city, end quote. During his two-month stay in Tunis, Ibn Battuta had the opportunity to immerse himself in the city's rich intellectual and religious traditions. He was given a place to stay in a religious school. The religious school, or madrasa, was a hub of learning and scholarship, attracting students from all over the Muslim world. Ibn Battuta was impressed by the depth of knowledge and dedication of the school's teachers who spent long hours instructing their students in the intricacies of Islamic law, theology, and philosophy. While at the madrasa, Ibn Battuta developed a deep appreciation for the intellectual traditions of Tunis and the wider Muslim world. He engaged in spirited debates with his fellow students, challenging and being challenged by their ideas and arguments. However, it was yet again time for Ibn Battuta to leave. As Battuta prepared to leave Tunis, he joined a fully-fledged travelling party for the first time in his travels. This group, known as a caravan, was a common mode of transportation in the medieval Islamic world. Caravans were not just groups of travellers, but were essentially mini-mobile governments, complete with officials appointed to various positions of authority. The caravan itself was a complex and sophisticated operation, with a hierarchical structure and a system of rules and regulations designed to ensure the smooth and efficient movement of people and goods across vast distances. The caravan was made up of a diverse array of people, including traders, pilgrims, and other travellers, all united by the common goal of reaching their destination safely and successfully. In this particular caravan, Ibn Battuta was appointed as the Qadi, or judge, a position of great responsibility and honour. As the Qadi, he was responsible for resolving disputes between the members of the caravan, ensuring the safety and well-being of the travellers, and upholding the principles of Islamic law and justice. This is it for today's episode. Join us in the next part as we watch Ibn Battuta cross the Sahara Desert and navigate the complex political landscape of the Islamic world. Along the way, he will fall in love and get married, experiencing personal transformations that will shape his journey in unexpected ways. Get ready for a thrilling adventure full of history, romance, and intrigue as we follow Ibn Battuta on his remarkable journey of discovery. Before we leave, I just wanted to thank you all for joining us on this adventure. Thank you for your time and attention. If you enjoyed the episode, please like it and share it with your friends and family. Best of luck and I hope you have a wonderful day.